My name is uh, George Costandi and I'll be the moderator today. We'd like to welcome you to Orchard and Causes webinar titled Marine Fire and Explosion Investigations. So I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Today we have Richard Curran joining us. He's the Vice President of Origin and Cause and is a forensic engineer with over 30 years of experience. He's conducted over 3,000 fire and explosion investigations and has been accepted and testified in court as an expert witness over 40 times across Canada and internationally. Uh, actually, Richard had just mentioned to me that he's been in court in Fiji, which is really cool. Uh, he is a Canada coordinator for the International Association of Marine Investigators and he lectures across Canada about the subject of marine fires and explosions. Richard specializes in chemical engineering. He does a lot of investigations relating to product liability, residential and commercial and industrial fires. He also has a, a, a niche specialty of wood burning appliances alongside uh, as well as marine related fires and explosions and uh, fire suppression systems and fire department litigations. So without further ado I'll pass off the mic to Richard who will jump right into the presentation. Okay welcome everybody. We're going to be talking ag again about fire investigations on boats but like any building fire we talk about determining the origin and then the cause. It's not the other way around. In any fire investigation, you must first zero in on the origin of the incident and within the place of origin, you find the cause. A lot of people use the term origin and cause and cause and origin interchangeably, but I'd like to correct that today because it's technically incorrect. In this webinar, we will go through the investigative process of a forensic engineer specific to marine fires and explosions. It will be clear then as to why there's no such thing as finding the cause and origin. It's origin then cause. So first, finding the origin. How do you determine where the fire originated? You work from the least damage to the greatest damage, like any structural fire. You complete, if possible, an exterior examination and then you work inside the vessel to determine where the fire originated. So there's no trend on a boat fire as to the extent of damage, like a building. You can have a building that has suffered minimal damage or you can have the expression of square burn powder, which is nothing but the foundation walls left. So here we've got an example of a boat that has suffered a fire damage um, minimal damage to the exterior. This is more typical of some of the boats that we look at. And then the extreme case is pieces. Now information to consider in all marine fire investigations is the time and place of the boat fire. Is the boat in an isolated area? What time of day did this fire happen? And also, is it at the beginning or end of the boating season? Now, in some cases, these are more relevant to arson-type fires, but it's still factors to consider. Physical evidence. We're looking at char patterns like we do in any building fire uh, on wood materials. Fiberglass delamination. Most boats nowadays are fiberglass and it's the epoxy resin that burns, not the fiberglass mat itself. So we look at the delayering of the fiberglass to determine which is burned longer. Again, we look at the area of lowest burning. That may be relevant to the origin of the fire uh, in, in most cases, but in some it could be as a result of other factors. We're looking at heat patterns. Heat patterns on metals, on plastics, Similarly, discoloration and melting of metals and melting of plastics. Now, this is a list of the most common fire causes. Accidental fires. Uh, we have fuel related, we have electrical, and we have other causes. And then we have arson. Those are the two basic categories. Now, within accidental fire causes, within a boat, you have the potential of being 
most of most boats are gasoline fueled, but there are several that are diesel fueled. Um, the prevalence of these larger cabin cruisers, pleasure craft, it's not unusual to find barbecues on a boat. So you can have propane uh, on board a boat. And some of them are not a 20 pound bottle. They could be connected in one place and the barbecue could be located in a different area. And so there could be rigid play, uh, plumbing involved. Some of the older sailboats used to have alcohol uh, cook stoves. So it's, it's a sort of an older uh, issue, but it's still around. And you can also have an engine oil fire. On, uh, within the electrical systems, you can have all boats have a 12 volt or typically a 12 volt DC system, but most boats now have shore power or generators, and so you also have 120 volt AC current running through the boat. Other, other causes, um, you can have spontaneous combustion. This can involve rags with uh, teak oil. A lot of boats have uh, teak finishes, teak decks, and teak oil is just linseed oil with uh, some other materials. And as everyone knows, linseed oil will self-heat. Um, fiberglass laminations themselves do not uh, self-heat but you do have issues if you improperly mix the fiberglass resin with hardener. Um, if that mixture is uh, too much uh, hardener, it can overheat itself and uh, cause a fire. Again, smoking materials, no different from any residential building. Uh, maintenance activities that can occur on a boat, uh, welding or grinding. Now here's our first example. Um, this is an accidental fire. It was on a, an Express 30 sailboat. Uh, in this scenario, um, the gentleman lived on board the boat, and um, so he was connected to shore power. Um, and he had left for work one morning, and uh, sometime at later, uh, a fire was discovered on the boat. So this is an overall view of the boat. There's very little damage to the exterior. In fact, no visible damage. We're now looking at the uh, hatch, which accesses the cabin area. And you can see that there is some damage around the hatch cover, indicating the fire started in the cabin area. Now what we're looking at now is a sail locker on the aft deck. Um, the important thing to note is these are not watertight compartments. They're designed that if a wave crashes over, they won't take in water, but they're not sealed. And you can see the underside of the hatch cover has suffered some heat and smoke damage. Now we're zooming in in that hatch cover, and you'll see in the center of the photograph a blackened uh, metal box which uh, you'll see later on, but that in turn is a typical duplex receptacle box that you would find in your house, um, not designed for marine purposes, and you'll see why. So here we are inside the cabin. Uh, we're looking from the rear or stern end of the cabin, looking forward, and you can see that the fire damage in the cabin is primarily high level. Now we're looking aft um, towards the rear, and you can see that the fire patterns now progress down lower to countertop level in the center of the photograph. Now we're focusing in on a specific area in that uh, area, and in the center of the photograph, you can see a orange uh, dial, which is a battery switch. Um, which will switch between, uh, depending on the on the type of switch, a, a multitude of batteries. To the left of that is your uh, breaker panel, and to the right is the location where the duplex receptacle was located. Now, a quick comparison. 
there is the battery switch um, on the front of it, and you can see there's very little damage to it. Um, flipping it over, you can see there's a lot of a lot more fire damage to the battery switch, but there's no evidence that the battery switch itself had caused this fire. Beside that is the duplex receptacle. Now here we are looking at the duplex receptacle, and you can see that two cords are plugged into the receptacle. Uh, you'll notice that the upper cord is actually um, a standard household electrical 14-2 cable that has had a plug spliced or connected to it. Uh, the lower portion was an actual power cord. Now again, this gentleman lived on board this boat, and so he's using appliances that are more typically found in a home, such as toasters or microwave ovens. Now we've opened up the receptacle, and you can see uh, that the back of the duplex receptacle is extensively fire damaged, particularly the lower half. And actually inside the receptacle you can see portions uh, where here there's actually melted uh, copper. There's actually melted copper right there. Now when we actually tried to remove one of the plugs, you can see that one of the prongs is completely melted off. And you can see the other prong has discolored, gone green with oxidation. What has happened here is because that receptacle box is not watertight or even moisture resistant, moisture collecting in the sail locker is infiltrating into this receptacle and over a prolonged period of time it's caused corrosion and we had a high resistance failure within the receptacle. So, take home points. Boat owners commonly make their own modifications to their own boats. They don't always use the proper materials. It is crucial to preserve the evidence, uh, preserve the scene and the evidence. And as an adjuster uh, or an investigator, you need to ask, have any repairs been done or modifications been done to the boat lately or in the past? Who did this work? And regardless of who did the work, obtain any detailed statements to protect yourself from liability. This is a second uh, electrical fire. Um, this, this scenario emphasized the importance of disconnecting all electrical sources when placing boats in storage. And basically this boat um, has been sailed extensively. In fact, it was sailed at one point across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it's a 47-foot 1999 Catalina yacht. Um, the boat had been placed in winter storage. And uh, the mast, as you can see, has been left in place. So it's sitting on a cradle on dry land. And um, in the spring, that the owner came on board to uh, get the boat ready for relaunch and discovered there had, at some point in time, been a fire. And it is self-extinguished. So again, looking on board the boat, uh, you can see there's not a lot of damage um, to the aft deck area. Again, notice that the mast is in place, and we're, we're right down on the lake. So wind during the winter is an important factor in this, this loss. Uh, now you're looking at the, attic, uh, the cabin hatch, and you can see that the plastic that was basically used uh, for weather protection for over the winter months has suffered heat damage. Again, no other exterior damage to this boat. Now looking down through the hatch cover, you can see that there is evidence of smoke and heat inside the cabin area. Now inside the cabin we're looking forward uh, towards the bow and you can see there's high level fire damage, uh, primarily heat and smoke, and it decreases towards uh, floor level in the cabin. And we're in the, the rear, rear section of the uh, cabin there. Now looking aft, 
uh, we see there's much more extensive damage to the left in the left photograph, which is what would we call the navigation table. On the right side is the galley. Uh, in the galley area, you can see the fire damage is all high, but we can see on the left side that the fire patterns go much lower down uh, behind that little partition. Now we're looking at the actual navigation area, and you can see there is a concentration of fire damage right in this area of the navigation area. So we're looking at the, the lowest area, and again, if you notice the orange, this is indicative of the battery uh, switch, um, which would again, switch between various batteries. And again, you can see the, the extensive fire damage concentrated in this area of the boat. Now, we're looking at the char pattern again to indicate was this fire external or internal to this area. And you see we focused on one little piece of the trim cover. And the exterior has some melted plastic on it and is relatively uncharred, whereas the inside is very deeply charred again indicating uh, the importance of char patterns to document the direction of fire travel. So you can see in the photograph the surface is smooth on one side and you look at the second photo deep charring which is the back side of the same piece. Again it tells you that the fire has spread from within this compartment out into the uh, boat. When we peel back that cover um, we want to dig closer to where the heat or the fire was coming from, and what we found was a lot of extensively damaged electrical wiring. Now, again, you will see the heavier gauge wires are indic indicative of uh, battery cables, and you'll see uh, in the lower portion of the photograph that one cable is completely severed. Again, notice the, a lot of the green oxide uh, on the uh, wires, on the conductors, again indicative of the fact that it's been exposed to a fire and uh, this has been sitting for some time afterwards. Now we're looking at several smaller conductors because again all of the electrical wiring is rooted through this area. So you can see that several of these smaller conductors again are discolored green and they also have been severed. And here's that section of cable that we looked at previously. Um, this is a, the batter, one of the battery cables. The contact for the switch is right there, and this is the remainder of the cable. Now, the fact that those wires have been severed suggests that there was electrical activity. Um, so where is the power coming from? Well, in the galley, or under the floor of the galley, are the batteries uh, for this boat. And you'll see in circle there that both sets of batteries, the cables and the batteries are, still, are all connected. So this boat had a 12-volt DC energized system in place. Uh, why? We really don't know because this boat is on shore. It has no need for any electrical power, but uh, that's what the owner did. So again, if you recall the first photograph uh, that I showed you of the boat, you can see the mast is up. And basically, winter winds have caused this boat to move and shake. And it, it, in addition to the normal sailing of the ship, has caused wires to rub against each other over a period of time, wear through the insulation, and eventually they caused uh, an electrical failure. The end result is if the batteries had not been left connected, the fire would not have occurred. So, um, summation. Uh, when boats are placed in winter storage, all electrical sources should be disconnected. There's no logical reason to keep batteries connected to the vessel's electrical system when a boat is in storage is a high risk and there's no reward. Um, 
questions an adjuster or investigator need to ask is um, if you fi receive a fire uh, loss of a boat in storage, was this boat winterized? Um, were the batteries disconnected? If so, who did the work? Uh, many marinas or storage facilities actually will disconnect the batteries for the owners before placing the boat in storage. And you know, aside from disconnecting the batteries, some people will take the batteries right out. There's no need for it, but the wires need to be disconnected. Um, obviously, the engines have to be winterized. And in this case, uh, if it's a smaller boat, the mast could have been taken down. In this case, the size of the mast, it wasn't an easy task. And you'll notice there were other adjacent boats all had the masts in place. So luckily for this, this fire has self-extinguished. But you notice there were other boats adjacent to it. If this fire had gotten spread, it could have taken out several other boats uh, in this fire. And of course, then you've got liability exposure. So now we deal with uh, fuel causes. And our first boat is a 1986 25 foot Doral Citation. The couple uh, who owned this boat bought it used. They did not have a marine surveyor uh, examine the boat. Uh, they just bought it, um, just like you would buy a used car. Um, on the day of the loss, they were refueling the boat at a marina, and prior to starting the engine, they ran the bilge fans, as they're supposed to, to uh, basically clear any gasoline vapors from the bilge area. Uh, once they had run it long enough, um, they attempted to start the engine, and an explosion occurred. Uh, there was no fire, and fortunately, the occupants were safe. safe. Uh, they were shaken, but they were not hurt. So here's uh, where the boat was filled, and that's the actual fuel pump. Um, so again, it's important to examine the area where the loss occurred, not just the vessel itself. As you can see in the photo, there was evidence of damage to the fuel pumping station from the explosion. Uh, it caused the glass to, glass to break um, on the fuel pump. It's important to note if the vessel had moved off, if the vessel has been moved off site, that physical evidence may be left behind and simply not found. So ideally, it's important to try and keep the boat at or near the scene of the incident and uh, preserve everything as much as possible. Uh, this not only speeds up the investigative process because more pieces of the puzzle, puzzle are available to them, but it also strengthens their technical opinion in court. Lawyers these days tend not to disagree with an expert's opinion on the stand, but more so focus on the response time, process of investigation, continuity of the scene in order to weaken the case. So be careful of what you're, what you're leaving behind for the investigator to look at. So now we're looking at the boat itself. And as you approach the boat, you can see um, that there's not a great deal of obvious signs of physical damage. But you will notice this line here, where the cabin superstructure and the hull have actually separated. There's a closer look of it. And again, you can see the separation between the two components. Uh, this is an indication of the flexing of the hull and the cabin due to the explosion. So obviously, we know there was fuel involved. They were refilling the boat. So the question is, where did this fuel come from? We look in the engine compartment, and you can see there's very little damage to the actual engine. Um, but you also see the railings along the aft deck have been torn off from uh, the explosion. And the hatch, the hatch, actually, the engine hatch cover was missing. And uh, you'll notice that the actual deck has been uh, fractured due to flexing. 
and it's very clear that an explosion has taken place at some point in time. Now we're looking inside the cabin and you can see uh, the staircase leading to the aft deck has been displaced and looking forward in the cabin you can see that the headliner uh, has been torn away from the, the cabin and just materials have been displaced, disrupted by the explosion. So again, looking at the aft deck and what we're now going to focus on is this cut area here uh, on the starboard side of, sorry, the port side of the uh, deck. Now within that area, uh, it's quite visible, you can see the large red hose and it's held in place with a clamp, an alligator clamp. This is the fuel fill line. So, again, the large red hose is the fuel fill line. Note the uh, masking tape on the hose. So, again, we, we see the masking tape and the alligator clamp in place. Now, this small little fitting, um, this connection is called the fuel vent line. And when a fuel tank is being filled, air in the tank needs to be displaced. Uh, so it's got to go somewhere and this fuel vent line provides a safe path, path for air and gas vapors to exit the boat. Uh, the fuel vent line is incredibly important because in its absence the vapors would accumulate in the engine compartment which unfortunately for the new boat owners uh, of this vessel, um, that's where the gas vapors did accumulate. As a result, the gasoline vapors accumulating in the engine compartment became ignited when the engine was started and an explosion resulted. Uh, fortunately, it was a lean explosion and nobody was hurt, but this could have been much more serious. So there is our vent line that was supposed to be attached to that uh, hull fitting. There should have been a securing clamp on uh, the fitting, uh, like the fuel fill line did. And instead, the pre it seems the previous owners uh, replaced that clamp with masking tape, which uh, was nothing short of reckless, and uh, obviously it didn't hold over a period of time. Again, how could somebody sell a boat in this condition in good conscience? Um, we don't know. And again, because this was concealed within the hull, it was not readily visible to anyone doing a, an, even a, a quick inspection of a boat like you would uh, buying a used car. Um, <clears throat> this you know, convinced me I wouldn't buy a used boat. Um, you just never know what, what you're getting on. So again, take home points, uh, purchasing a used boat a used boat has its risks, so does insuring them. Uh, questions you need to ask on every file. When and where and when did the, uh, the insured buy the boat? Was it previously owned, and if so, by whom? Um, was the uh, a, a marine surveyor retained to examine the boat, and if so, who was it? and what was their experience and qualifications. Was there any recent service work done on this boat or if they know of stuff, any work done before they purchased it? And again, if so, who did the work? Now we're looking at a boat involving careless workmanship. This is a 2001 Carver 350. Um, the the owners of this boat um, were on a family vacation um, in Georgian Bay and uh, while they were at sea they noticed uh, they were having engine problems and they went to the closest port and made arrangements by radio for a mechanic to come and do repairs on the boat. 
as the mechanics were on board, and there were two of them, uh, as they were taking place, uh, they were looking at the two engines, and they were one one of the mechanics was on the helm, and he was operating the engines, revving them up, lowering the revs, and the second gentleman had been down in the engine compartment, and he left a tool attached to the fuel rail of one of the running engines and walked came out of the engine compartment was walking up to the helm and um, shortly after his departure a fireball went through this boat and uh, fortunately everybody escaped now when I actually attended this scene initially uh, which the boat was still in the water this is what we had uh, the it's not uncommon to find a boat submerged or partially submerged after a fire because in a lot of cases the fire department will fill the boat up with water you know and let it sink in order to quickly extinguish the fire um, in this case unfortunately or fortunately the municipality the municipal fire department had kept the boat afloat uh, using portable pumps but then the local um, city mayor or town mayor decided that he didn't want his tax dollars spent uh, keeping this boat afloat and he ordered the fire department to remove them. Subsequently the boat sank and this is the scene that we were greeted with. We then had to arrange for commercial divers to come and put flotations on it and operate pumps to get all of the water out of the boat so that we could get it to a, a float and then remove it from the marina to a dry land position for further examination. So here's the boat after it's been refloated, just to give an overall view of the extensive damage to this boat. And another photo, and again, this is looking forward. You can see the cabin area has been consumed. Basically, the, the, the entire boat is destroyed. Now we're on dry land and now we can get into a more detailed examination to figure out what had taken place and what the root cause of this incident was. So now we're on the uh, forward cabin area looking towards the stern and you can see the cabin has, the exterior of the cabin has been burned as well as the interior but you can see the rear cabin area which this had an aft cabin is totally consumed. Now, we're, after conducting the ex exterior examination, it was clear we needed to take a look at the engines. Um, the two engines are circled in red. Here is the starboard engine and fuel tank on the left, and the port engine and fuel tank on the right. Now, I'm going to do a poll here. Which of the two do you think sustained the greatest fire damage? A polling tool will pop up on your screen click on the answer you think is right the correct answer is uh, the port engine I th think everybody what was the so 63 percent said the, the port, port engine? engine okay great so first off you can see on the starboard engine um, there is the air filter this is this silver area, silver area. That's the, the air filter. And if you notice on the port engine, it's missing and there's significantly more damage to this area. Also, you'll notice that the port engine, or sorry, the port fuel tank, which is located here, has suffered uh, heat damage. Um, it's, it's melted. It's, it's what's called eutectic melting, the aluminum got hot enough that it was no longer had any strength and it collapsed. It didn't physically melt, um, but it just collapsed due to loss of strength. But you'll notice that the starboard engine is relatively undamaged. Okay, now we're looking at the port engine. Um, now you can see the, the first item is the carburetor. You can see that the air filter is completely gone. 
uh, the carburetor has uh, melted and again you can see that the melting on the carburetor is from the front of the engine towards the, the, the back very directional indi indicating where the heat is coming from the second item is the fuel rail now this is a these were fuel injected engines and everyone who has a newer car probably is familiar with a fuel uh, injection system but the gasoline is delivered uh, from the tanks by a pump to the fuel rail which then sends it down to the fuel injectors so there's a circulation of high pressure gasoline going through this fuel rail uh, excess gasoline is returning to the tank and the last item is the Schrader valve now the Schrader valve is used by mechanics to bleed air out of the fuel rail when work is being done on it. If it's been disconnected, reattached, so you want to bleed any air out of the uh, fuel system. Uh, Schrader valve is basically what your bicycle or your car tire has to, to put air into the car. Now, we're taking a look at the two fuel rails. So the one on the left is the um, fuel rail for the starboard engine and the one on the right is the uh, Schrader valve for the port engine. Uh, there, now note there's an additional fitting on the port engine Schrader valve. Um, this, this was important and it helped us to zero in on not uh, partially on the origin of the fire and also the cause. Um, as a result of this work, we uh, removed the fuel rail from the port engine along with the carburetor and took them back to our laboratory for further examination. So here now we're looking at the uh, right on the right hand side you see the fuel rail and carburetor and on the left in the smaller photograph you can see that we've removed a section from that was attached to the Schrader valve. Now if you look at the Schrader valve there, there's still another fitting attached to it, um, but also notice there's a downward deflection in both cases, it's more emphasized here, but there's a downward deflection of this whole assembly and that was an, again an indication of what had happened uh, to cause this loss. Uh, we removed the fitting uh, that was identified as being the end of a pressure gauge and uh, they were using, the mechanics were using this to measure, monitor the pressure in the fuel rail and we went to a auto supply place and we found the exact model used by the mechanics. This is this, uh, this is the gauge that was, is an exemplar that was being used at the time of the loss to measure the pressure in the fuel rail. It was left unattended and it wasn't secured to anything. It was in fact left sitting on top of the engine and it's our conclusion was that the gauge because of the vibration and rocking of the engine, the gauge uh, fell off and either the black hose snagged on the operating pulley or the clear plastic hose which is a bleed line snagged on the pulley, the end result was that the, the whole assembly separated from this little brass fitting and now you've got an open line which caused the trader valve to bend downward, that's the, the result of it being snagged and it caused high pressure gasoline to spray out into the engine compartment and again here's the, the, and showing the, the two components and you can see that the black hose is crimped and fitted onto the barb connection of, uh, that was attached to the Schrader valve assembly. Uh, the end result was um, this, this subrogation was uh, successful. The marine mechanics were held liable for the damage to this boat and also to a, another boat that was severely damaged uh, that was docked next to it. So, take home points. 
faulty workmanship, improper installations, improper choice of materials used in installations, or improper choice of equipment used in repairs can happen, and it happens very, very frequently. Make sure to get as much information about the service work and the mechanics when receiving the claim. Uh, because there's no such thing as a certified mechanic, uh, there are no regulatory bodies uh, providing formal training programs or licensing for this vacation. It's simply a mechanic specializing in boats based on their exposure and experience. Therefore, the quality of workmanship and the repairs done to boats is dependent on the quality of informal training and experience the mechanic has that he was from working on the boats. It's luck of the draw, basically. So the question you need to ask, name of the company that did the repairs, the mechanics information, his qualifications. What components were repaired, replaced, and from where? And were these components suitable for a marine application? So here's another fire. Uh, this is a human error. Um, it's an unfortunate story. It teaches us that sometimes the simplest of tasks have dire consequences. The uh, story goes the owner had been working on this boat, preparing it for winter storage. Um, this is a bay liner. He was working in the engine compartment when a flash fire occurred. Um, the owner inhaled got hot gases and was hospitalized and subsequently died as a result of his injuries. Now, here's a photo of the interior of the cabin. Uh, as you can see, there is no, virtually no damage to the cabin. We're now looking underneath the cabin, which is the access to the engine compartment. Uh, the, so this is some of the insulation material um, on the underside of the cabin hatch. And you can see that it has suffered heat damage, uh, fire damage from a flash fire not been badly consumed. Now, what we're looking at here is you can see that the batteries have been disconnected. And this tells us where he had been working at the time the incident occurred. Um, in this photograph, you can see there's a plastic Dixie cup right here with a toothbrush in it and baking soda. Um, it didn't have anything to do with the cause, but it just shows us or told us a story as to what he was doing at the time of the accident. Um, again, here's evidence of fire damage. You can see, again, some of the bilge um, ducting for the bilge fans were heat damaged due to the flash fire and scorching of adjacent material. Now, this, is, this was found in the engine compartment near the battery. It's an aerosol can of spray lubricant. Um, similar to WD-40, but it's sold by uh, a chain of stores. Um, and it may, why it was there, we don't know, and it may have been used to spray on the terminal posts of the batteries just to cover them with oil, keep them from corroding over the winter. Now, here we're looking at a closer look at the can, and you'll notice in the black arrow, there's a small hole in the side of the container. And this container had a painted label, uh, which means that you have a bare strip of metal uh, where the seam of the can when it's manufactured is located. And that little hole is very significant. Uh, here's a close-up of the, the hole. Uh, as I said, it went right, it, right through the can. Now we're looking uh, at the, the bottom of the can, and we also found a small melted area on the rim uh, of the bottom rim. So when we measured the distance between these two, uh, it was just over five inches uh, between the two spaces. And when we measured the actual distance between the two terminal posts on the battery, we found the same dimensions. And this product uses propane as a propellant or the material to expel the lubricant in the can. And somehow this container fell onto the battery it created a short circuit, which in turn burned a hole into the side of the container and resulted in the discharge of the pressurized propane. As the can rolled off one of the terminal posts, a spark was created, 
uh, and this resulted in the ignition of the propane and a flash fire. So again, take home points. Humans make mistakes. Some have more dire consequences than others. Uh, many people do their own repairs on boats. They take the air filters off and run the engines and they get a backfire and next thing you know their boat's on fire. So the nature of boats having confined areas also make it difficult sometimes to do the most simplest of tasks. There's very limited area in, uh, in the engine compartments. So it makes it a little more cumbersome, a little more difficult to work. And uh, some, so as I said, sometimes the human error can have a, a big play in this. So questions you need to ask. Focus on the insured, uh, their actions, their background experience. Um, are they Joe Blow um, amateur mechanic and think they know something about engines or do they actually have some experience? If they purchase products, find out where they purchase them from, if there's any chance that the receipts were kept because there still could be the potential of product liability. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next cause of this loss I'd like to talk about is a manufacturer's defect. In other words, the liability of the boat builder. Um, in this case, there was also poor workmanship component. We're looking at a 2006 48-foot Ocean Alexander. The boat is built in China. Uh, the insured ordered the, boat, ordered the boat from a sales broker soon after he found out he had been diagnosed with uh, cancer and was terminally ill. This was his last toy. After the boat was built, it was delivered to the United States by sea, and it was brought to an upper New York State marina uh, where the boat was repainted, and the marina installed a fire suppression system. Once uh, this work was done, the boat was sailed back to Ontario, and upon arrival, uh, it caught fire. The, the operators of the boat, which were not the owners, uh, tried to, once the fire was discovered, they tried to operate the fire suppression system manually and it didn't work. The damages to this boat were extensive. It was a large loss. Several parties were put on notice, including the boat manufacturer, the fire suppression manufacturer, as well as the New York State Marina, where the work was uh, done, and also the sales broker. I was brought onto the investigation to uh, investigate the cause of the loss as it was unclear at the time as to what happened and why the fire suppression system did not work. So here's a quick view of the main cabin area. You can see this is a luxury boat. This is a million dollar boat. All the interior is teak. Um, it's, it's state of the art. You can see here we're looking at the rear portion of the main cabin area. And you can see that the fire has come up from below uh, to the walls of the cabin. Um, and since the damages were low, it, it told me that the fire progressed from the area below the, uh, below the cabin, which is where the engines were located. Now we're looking at the one of the two access hatches. Uh, this one's inside the cabin, which leads down into the engine compartment. And you can see on the hatch cover itself, and below, there's extensive fire damage down there. We're now looking at the two engines, um, and we're looking facing towards the stern of the boat. Um, you can see that the engine on the right, on the left side, has less damage than the engine on the left. Oh, sorry, on the right. Now, this is the area that was identified as the the suspected area of origin. This is where the greatest fire damage was located. In fact, this bulkhead has suffered extensive damage. Battery switches were located in this area. Um, and so this is where we believe the fire to have started near this area. Now more important, note the red cylinder on the right hand side. This was the fire suppression system. And you can see how close it is to the actual fire. There's another view of the cylinder, and you can see that it's been actually subjected to heat. Uh, it's designed to be positioned near the, the engines in case 
of a, a fire, and it's designed to automate activate automatically and extinguish the fire by flooding the entire engine compartment with a gas uh, to suffocate the fire. In this case, it obviously didn't work. Now, what we're focusing in is the way these systems work is there's a glass bulb which is located within this circle area, within that circle area, and when it's exposed to heat, the bulb has, is, has a liquid and it breaks as the liquid expands and it discharges this, the fire suppression agent, extinguishing the fire. We're looking at the same component and there is the glass cylinder still in place and intact. We've now removed the cylinder because it was important that we preserve that for further examination. When we took it back to the lab and with the manufacturer of the fire suppression system, we found out that the bulb was actually cracked, but there was no liquid inside of it, which meant that when it was exposed to the fire, the liquid seeped out of the crack, did not break the bulb as intended. And the bulb needs to break to open the fire suppression valve. So here's a closer look at the bulb, the valve, sorry, the bulb, and we see that the cracks shown by the arrows were there. We've just taken out the broken pieces. And we determined that the crack took place during the installation process was not a manufacturing defect. We actually found out these components are subjected to extensive vibration testing uh, before they're ever put on a boat. So now we're looking at the helm inside the cabin and the arrow points to the manual activator for the fire suppression system. This is uh, the backup in case the automatic system fails. The operator pulls the red handle which will manually break the bulb uh, break the glass bulb and have activate the fire suppression system. Now that little red arrow points to the metal ring and the attached tab which the cable would be attached to. When he pulls that it breaks the bulb the system goes off. Well when the operator of the boat pulled the handle this is what happened. It just came out all in one piece. So when we looked at this very closely, you can see that the installer of the system used a drill bit much too large and force fit the handle into the dash uh, in other, instead of making a small hole and the nut and washer be on the underside of that uh, plywood. Again, another view. Therefore, the reason why the manual, this is the reason the manual activation failed to, to uh, operate. And this was due to an installation error. So, not all manufactured boats are built to North American standards. It's very important. Boats in, in the Europe tend to be, but if you go to the Far East, they, may, they probably are not. Uh, if you've been indicated as an interested party uh, on a boat loss, retain an expert right away and show up to all examinations. Uh, this is why I say this is in this case all the interested parties participate in the examination of the boat with the exception of the marina in the US. When they showed up to the pretrial, they arrived with a theory as to the causation of the fire uh, which was quickly dismissed due to the fact that the issues had already been addressed by all the opposing experts during the joint examinations uh, put them at a big disadvantage. The pretrial judgment placed 75% of the damages uh, on the marina despite the fact their work did not cause this fire. I believe if they had been present throughout the process the conclusion would have been more favorable to them. Questions you need to ask. Obtain all purchasing documentation. Very valuable. Where was it purchased? Was any work done after delivery? If so, who did the work? Just before we continue, uh, I do notice that it is 2 o'clock, which is supposed to be our cutoff time. Richard has one more example than a conclusion and a Q&A period, which we would have probably for about five minutes or so. If you do have to drop off, we do understand and apologize. Um, uh, you will still be 
able to receive a completion certificate. We do know when you've dropped off, so thank you very much for joining us. But for those that can afford another 10 minutes or so that um, to go through uh, the rest, of, including a Q&A, please feel free to stay with us. For those that can't stay for the Q&A, it will all be recorded and it will be attached to our YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube and we'll send you an email with that link in case you want to hear all the questions. So we'll proceed with Richard. I apologize, I'm long-winded. This is the last case. Um, this is an arson fire. It's a 1992 24-foot Sea Ray. The boat was in winter storage and you can see it's winter time. There's snow around. The owner had been on board the boat that day to check on it, in quotation marks. A short time later, the fire was discovered on the boat, and the fire was quickly extinguished. Again, quick shot of the exterior. There's no damage to the exterior of this boat. We look inside the boat. We can see there's fire damage contained to the cabin area. Look, quick look at the engines. No fire damage in the engine area. Batteries are connected, but there's no damage in that area. Now we're looking into the cabin, and you can see the progression of fire damage is from the bow towards the rear of the boat, or the rear of the cabin. Quick view of the cabin area, you can see extensive fire damage towards the bow end. Again, melting of plastics, discoloration and heat damage to the plastic headliner or fiberglass headliner. We have low burning down at floor level at the front end of the cabin. Um, this is very important and this is the area we're focusing on right here. A closer view and you can see the localized damage. In fact, you can see the red carpeting that lined the walkway here is consumed all in just one localized area. Now, after the scene examination, it was determined we knew this was an intentionally set fire found out that the police had seized evidence from the scene and they allowed us to take a quick view of it and this is the object. They also allowed us to take a photograph of the object which in turns out to be uh, this, this little container here. And what this is, is uh, a plastic bottle containing a flammable liquid with a wick attached to it. Um, the loss by the police was confirmed to be intentionally set and we determined the same thing and the claim was subsequently denied. So, this is a pretty straightforward arson case. Not all of them are that simple, but I want to emphasize the importance of something I brought up at the beginning of the seminar, a webinar. It's important to know when and where the loss took place, the time of year, the activities of the insured prior to the loss, you need to consider if the boat was found in an isolated area, what time of the day the loss took place, whether it happened in the beginning or the end of the boating season. A lot of arsonists are trying to get rid of their boat at the beginning of the season to buy a new one, or for whatever reason it can't sell. Or we also see them at the end of the season in cases where extensive amounts of repairs are required in order to sell the boat, and they decide to go the criminal route rather than to spend the money to repair. So the question you need to ask, condition of the boat prior to the fire, recent photos of the boat, service documents, had the boat been up for sale? Many of the storage facilities have surveillance systems in place or limited access, so try and make sure to get access to that footage or any documents relating to who, was on, who accessed the yard. In this case, we were able to establish the owner was on site prior to the fire due to the marina's records. Here at Origin and Cause, we have CCTV footage extraction tools where we can pull footage out of a DVR, which is very helpful in a lot of our fire investigations. I'd like to thank you all and take any questions you have right now. What was the cause in the second last incident? So let's just pull that up here. The, the oh, one that yeah. was manufactured in China. Alexander. We were never able to specifically, we suspect the fire was electrical in causation uh, due to the extensive damage um, to the electrical wiring and we had several visits to this boat. We pulled, in fact, all that cabin you saw intact, we pulled 
actually the whole deck area, cut it out and removed it. We actually pulled the engines out so we could get to wiring um, throughout the area. We could not find the specific failure, but doing some research and my contacts through IAMI in the United States, I found out that there were several other incidents of electrical fires on Ocean and Alexander's in the U.S. and talking to marine surveyors, these, uh, manuf this manufacturer is notorious for using splices in their electrical runs when they're supposed to use continuous cables. So there's a history of electrical issues with this boat. We knew we actually had the engines examined. They were eliminated as a cause, so we were left with an electrical fire. Great. Thank you, Richard. Next question here. What other arsons have you been involved in? Been involved in several arson fires, um, not all of them involving the actual owners. Um, recently did a racing boat that was in a um, being being worked on and was in a yard and we actually had on a surveillance video where watch some guy will cutting through the, the the yard and stops at the boat, climbs up on the trailer and leans in, and two minutes later the boat's on fire. Uh, also had ones um, in Oakville where there was half a dozen boats that were eventually damaged by fire, and um, they're all docked in a, a public park uh, and. Uh, in the middle of the night, one of the boats caught fire. We were able to narrow it down to a specific boat, um, and we believe somebody had climbed on board the boat, set it on fire, and then walked away. So would you say that there's, have you noticed any trends of, like, in arsons uh, that are worth noting? No, there's no, there's no real, there's no real trend. I mean, you get owners that have destroyed their boats. Again, depends on, um, Depends on the how bad uh, the mark, you know, how 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 good the economy is. Basically, if a guy has a boat, can't make his payments, like a car, so it goes up and down. Um, a lot, most, well, all all of the intentionally set fires typically occur at night, after hours. Interesting. Okay. Next question. A lot of the examples that you mentioned relate to small to medium-sized boats. Do you ever do investigations on large vessels like importing or exporting vessels or military boats? Yes, I've been involved in many uh, fires, not on military, but um, on both Lakers and uh, ocean-going vessels. Um, we've been retained and been involved in those investigations. They're no different. They're just, they usually are not because they're all steel, they don't cause as much damage, but they're much more complex. But the same principles still apply in doing the origin and cause investigation. Great. Another question, how is continuity maintained until you're able to attend? And if it is not secure, how does that affect your investigation? Um, well, okay, number one, if the boat is it's typically the boats are taken to, uh, if they're taken out of the water, they're put in a, a locked yard. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, which one we were still working or still working on, it was actually um, taken from the scene and it was covered completely sealed up with plastic. So you could not get into the boat until we physically cut it off. Um, but yes, continuity of the evidence is, is critical and um, Particularly if it's an, an, you know an intentionally set fire is very very critical, um, but you know we try and preserve as much as possible, and that's not always happens because you know they move the boat, things get thrown inside the boat that had been displaced and turn, turned around. So we have to try and recreate as much as we can. Great. Next question: Would you caution on the purchase of international boats and practice diligence in buying? Or, in your experience, the losses are across the board? I, I would caution on buying a, a foreign-made boat. Uh, not, not, a, not that a European, there's anything wrong with a European boat, but I, I would do a bit of research, um, try and find out, talk to marine surveyors. Um, they're they're going to know historically um, what what boats uh, have issues, what boats don't have issues, and that applies to North American boats too. 
I mean, you can have, you know, defects. You can have manufacturers who have problems. So, you know, before, like, when you're buying a car, you need to do your research on, on a boat. And uh, as I said, if, you know, if you haven't retained a marine surveyor, call one, you know, search them out and pick their brain. They're very knowledgeable uh, and uh, they're going to be able to help you a lot. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. That is our time. Pretty much, Origin and Cause was established 25 years ago. We're the largest forensic engineering and fire investigation firm in Canada. We have 11 locations across the country and over 35 experts. Our offices are in Ancaster, Mississauga, Kingston, Ottawa, Sudbury, London, Windsor, Halifax, Winnipeg, Calgary and Edmonton. Our geographical spread has proven to be a great strategy, uh, strategic advantage for us. Our clients love the fact that we're able to get on site so quickly to control spoliation and to complete our investigation so quickly because we actually have a local um, forensic expert available. So we've been working really hard to become a national forensic solution for our clients and we're a preferred vendor on um, many of the lists of the large insurers in the Canadian market. So our services include fire and explosion investigation, we have a canine unit, structural engineering services, electrical engineering services, and part of our electrical team we have alarm system analysis, uh, uh, several types of hardware and software to interpret uh, information and extract information from alarm systems and CCTV uh, uh, systems as well. We also have a mechanical engineering unit which also has data extraction services uh, from uh, uh, event data recorders and black boxes. We have a materials and metallurgical engineering group and a chemical engineering group. That's actually Richard in, the, in that picture in the lab. And also we have forensic litigation services. Uh, we're the industry leaders when it comes to forensic litigation experience. Origin and Cause has been involved in over uh, 1,500 legal cases and qualified as expert witnesses in all levels and types of Canadian courts. We've testified as expert witnesses in over 170 litigation proceedings in Canada, the United States and internationally. I encourage you guys to go on our website. We've got great resources. Um, one resource that we do is we, we push out a, uh, a monthly newsletter with one new uh, original uh, article that we've written. Some examples are, you know, three questions to be asking an adjuster, or sorry, an adjuster should be asking on the day of the incident. Um, there's a lot of materials and metallurgical topics uh, relating to braided hoses and sump pump failures and stuff like that. Um, our most, our most um, up-to-date article that we just pushed out a couple of days ago is by our uh, fire and explosion investigator in Halifax, Mario Delorme, and it's an amazing article about the art of interviewing. It's, it's, it's how to carry yourself it, while taking an interview from an insured or from a claimant. There's great tips about body language, how to ask questions and stuff, so I really encourage you guys to take a look at that. If, um, if you can't find it on the website, just email me or you can email webinar at origin-n-cause.com and I'll make sure that I get that article for you. Uh, we'll send you all completion certificates and a follow-up email as I'd mentioned. If you're part of a group right now and uh, you won't get a completion certificate unless you send us your email and your name and contact information. So please send that to webinar at originandcause.com or origin-and-cause.com. As soon as the webinar ends, there will be a, a window that pops up on your screen asking you six, or sorry, uh, four feedback questions. We'd love to hear some feedback from you so we can improve for future webinars. Uh, you have Richard's contact information there. Please feel free to contact him. And thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.